Hawaii Energy Colloquium and the uh, Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Science uh, Department Lecture Series. We're very happy to have uh, Rule Snyder here today, who is the Keck Distinguished Professor of Basic Exploration at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, Rule is not just an accomplished scholar, I just looked. His H index is 48, and he has 10 papers that have been cited more than 100 times. But he is also a dedicated teacher who is very interested in how we do science and in also in how we pass that scientific knowledge on to the public. And I think that's what partly got him interested in talking first about energy, where he spent a sabbatical talking about energy issues to high school students. Um, and then on to the topic that he's going to talk about today, which is rethinking <coughs> carbon capture and sequestration. So. With that, I will pass on to Rolf. Yeah. So thank you. you know, it, it's, it's great to see such a big crowd. I apologize for you sitting in the back that you uh, probably don't have the greatest view. I want to applaud all the people sitting here in the front row. And you know, I, I took my medication this morning. You are absolutely safe. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about carbon sequestration. And this is going to be a very simple talk. And we're going to talk about carbon sequestration. It, it's going to be conceptually very simple. Uh, the, the hard part is the numbers. You need to understand the numbers to understand what carbon sequestration means and what it could do for mitigating climate change or not. And so we're going to talk about numbers and, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about giving meaning to, to, to these numbers. Um, many of my slides you will find really simple and there's a good reason for that because as Alison just indicated, I spend a lot of time on energy education and I'll, I'll come back to that at the end of my presentation, but I think education has to be part of part of the solution of climate change issues. If we have an uninformed public, uh, it's going to be very difficult to do something. And you know, if you've read newspapers recently, it will be obvious to you, to you why. So I think education is, a, is an important part. And that's why also some of the slides, you will, uh, they will be of a simplicity that you may not be uh, used to at a place like MIT. But some things are really simple. And if they are, we shouldn't make them more complicated. So what I'm going to do now is first you know, sketch the, the, the big energy picture talking to climate change, and you probably know a whole lot of that. And then we're going to talk about carbon sequestration as a, as a tool for uh, mitigating climate change and basically getting rid of, of carbon. And what are the challenges that we face in, in, in doing so? Um, so let's first look at sort of the big picture of our, of our energy use. Um, here, this is the projected worldwide energy uh, demand grown from 1980 on the left to 2030 on the right. And you can see that over the next uh, 20 years or so, um, we have a 70% increase in the worldwide energy demand. So that, that's basically a given. You know, barring disaster, this is going to happen. This is, this is on, on our path. Uh, and so if you think we use a lot of energy today, if you think we are producing a lot of carbon today, you haven't seen anything yet. You know, this, is, this is only the, only the beginning. And a lot of that, that, that growth comes from, um, comes from developing countries. Um, and I love this little symbol, the, the, the car on the bottom right is called the Tata Nano. It's a little car that you can buy in India for about $2,500. And the idea is that many of the people who now walk in the streets and ride their bicycles and, and whatever way of transportation they have now, they can <coughs> drive their cars and probably be stuck in horrific traffic jams. Uh, but these people aspire to a style of living which more closely resembles ours. And that is just, like I said, barring disaster that is just unstoppable, that is going to happen. So there's uh, more than two billion people in China and India alone who are just want to live more like we do. And you know, if you, if, you, um, if you look at the cars we drive, of course we have no moral ground to stand on that these people cannot drive their cars. In fact, our cars use a lot more fuel than, than the Tata Nano. And um, so this is happening, this is in the pipeline, this is happening big time. You know, General Motors sells more cars in China now than it does in the United States tells us something. Um, so that, that, that's the driver for that energy use. Now let's look at the type of energy that, 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 we, that we use. Uh, worldwide, about 40% of our energy comes from petroleum, 20% comes from coal, 20% from natural <coughs> gas, um, and then renewables is about 10% and nuclear is about 10%. And of course, when we look into the future, everything becomes a little bit uncertain, but these are sort of the this is a little bit dated, this graph, but this was our best outlook in 2006, which means that 80% of our energy currently comes from what is called fossil fuels, 
Um, and according to this scenario, that percentage is going to rise in addition to that increase in energy use worldwide. Um, and, and the significance of that, I mean, of the word fossil fuels is that, that we're basically burning carbon. So 80% of our energy comes from carbon. And so that ties in the whole issue of uh, carbon um, energy use and, and, and climate change. I want to talk a little bit about oil. Um, there's been a lot of talk about peak oil. And, and so and this is now we're talking about conventional conventional oil. It's a very contentious issue here. You see, I looked at about 30 scenarios. Uh, these were the most optimistic scenarios I could find. <coughs> these are from the USGS, predicting oil production to peak somewhere between 15 and um, 30, 40 years from now. Uh, other scenarios say that petroleum production peaks right now. I think the answer is nobody really knows. And obviously, there's a lot happening now in, in um, the production of hydrocarbons, both natural gas and, and petroleum, in terms of uh, horizontal drilling and, and, and fracking. But it's still an important issue because I, I want you to be aware that oil prices are at about $100 per barrel right now. That's a lot. That's a lot. And um, when, I, when I talk to the general public about, about peak oil and energy, uh, people, the question I often get is, well, okay, we may be at, at, at a peak production right now, but it may still take us you know, 50 years before we run out of a resource. Who really cares? But that's not really the right way to look at it, because in a time of rising demand, as we are having right now, the moment you get a dip in supply, you get a, you get a very tense market. Uh, when, when demand is outstripping supply, you get high prices, you get volatile prices. Um, and it's really interesting if you look at petroleum production. This is from a paper in, um, in Nature, a recent paper in Nature. Um, and it's a cross plot of petroleum production on the horizontal axis in millions of barrels per day versus uh, the price of petroleum. And it's very interesting. If you look at the gray points, um, which is data between 1998 and 2004, you basically see a slope, meaning that if the, if the, it really reflects that if the demand goes up, we can meet that demand. We get a higher supply, so we have higher production. Uh, but the price also goes up. And then typically, we had oil prices somewhere between 20 and $40 um, dollars per barrel. And then you can see that since uh, 2005, those are the black dots, the price of oil goes up and down, and the production doesn't go up and down at all. <coughs> that tells us something about, about petroleum production. And you know, these are, these are data, right? I mean, these are, these are just a cross plot of data. Uh, so we're living in interesting times when it comes to, uh, to energy. I also want to sort of reiterate that, uh, and you know this, but how, how energy production is related to politics. I mean, here you see a map of the world where the size of every country is, is proportional to the estimated reserves of every country. And I mean, you don't need to be a major in political science to figure out how much of the, our, full, our foreign policy is related to petroleum. I mean, look at it, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran. Have you heard about these countries recently? You know, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's obviously there's a lot going on in terms of politics that is related to, uh, to petroleum. But the reason I show you this, uh, this graph, or this map actually, is India and China that you see all the way on the right. I mean, rapidly industrializing countries, about two billion people, two plus billion people living in these two countries, and obviously, um, in terms of petroleum, they're not a player. So. I mean, now you know why China is the biggest donor of development aid to Nigeria, for example. I mean, the map tells you the story. Um, and so, you know, just having a big comprehensive plan on what is our energy future going to be, I think, I think is needed. And, and I, I don't see who's making the plan right now. And, you know, I, anybody who's interested in this, I want to encourage you to, to sort of be, open your voice and, and help, help shape a plan because I don't think there's a plan right now rather than produce where we can re produce and burn what we can burn. And that's it. That seems to be our plan right now. So, so here's the plan. Um, in the absence of a plan, this is the plan. Non-conventional petroleum, obviously. Um, shale, heavy oil, tar sands. Did you notice, by the way, regardless of whether people use the word tar sand or heavy oil, you immediately know where they are from an environmental point of view? It's very interesting if you read articles about the Keystone Pipeline. If they mention, if they mention tar sands, it, it's, it's net. And if they, are, if they say heavy oil, they are in favor. Um, so non-conventional resources, there's a lot happening. 
these days. Um, these non-conventional resources come sometimes at a pretty hefty environmental price. I want to encourage you to, if you want to depress yourself, go to Google Maps and look, go to the province of Alberta, north of Fort McMurray, and where you can see the big open pit mines that are uh, being created to produce the heavy oil or the tar sands. Um, there's a lot going on. It takes a lot of water to produce these fuels. It also takes more energy than, produce, than to produce the, the traditional fuels. Um, of course, there's coal. There's a lot of coal. Uh, and I know in the United States, we are sort of winding down to a certain extent our coal production, especially with the price of gas being really low. Um, but for China, for example, this is a major source of energy. I mean, the, the amount of coal-fired power plants that are being built is pretty, pretty enormous. And then, of course, there is what recently happened in the United States, the natural, I, th I think we can call it the natural gas revolution. I don't know how long it's going to last, but for now, uh, we've become very successful at producing, producing natural gas. Um, and as you know, there's environmental concerns about it, but there's also benefits about it, because per unit energy that we produce, uh, methane is from the fossil fuels the, the produce the least amounts of carbon dioxide. So let, let's just look at some numbers. Here you see the, the, the worldwide CO2 emissions for different parts of the world uh, per capita. And so what, there's, a, there's a couple of interesting things happening there. So first of all, for the United States, you see that we are using, uh, we are producing less CO2 per person than we used to. And it, it's a combination of two things. Part of it is that we are becoming slightly uh, slightly more efficient in the way we use energy. And part of it is also that we are uh, burning more and more natural gas instead of coal. And natural gas produces less uh, carbon dioxide per unit energy than coal does. So that, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is, of course, that the United States is all the way at the top. It's interesting to compare, for example, the, the CO2 emissions in the United States versus the European Union. Because if you had the choice of living in Switzerland versus living in the United States in terms of standard of living, what would you pick? It would be sort of hard, right? I mean, it's hard to say that the Swiss are suffering because they use less energy. And so, I mean, it really shows that you can be a developed country and have a high standard of living and produce about half the amount of CO2 than the United States does. It's interesting that the Russian Federation goes up uh, in terms of CO2 use. Um, uh, but again, the real kickers are India and China. You can see that China is, is rapidly going up. It's about to cross per capita the, uh, the amount of CO2 emissions that's, that Europe has right now. And then you need to multiply this with one point, what is it, 1.2 billion people. And, and you can see that has, of course, a huge effect on the global, the global emissions. So this is a very interesting graph because it tells so much about how in different societies we use energy in different ways. And also how that a higher uh, CO2 production, which really is a higher energy use, doesn't necessarily mean a lower standard of living. Unless you'd want to argue that the US has a much higher standard of living than many European countries do. So this is a fascinating, fascinating graph to me. So let's, let's talk about climate then. And, th and this is the, the famous hockey stick curve that you have seen. It shows you the carbon dioxide concentration over the last uh, 10,000 years. It's called the hockey stick curve because of the, it looks like a hockey stick. And the, the inset shows us what happens in the last um, 200 years or so. And then you can see basically carbon dioxide went basically up very, very quickly um, since the Industrial Revolution. So we know where the carbon comes from. You know what it does, that, that's, that can be a different story, but we know that we are producing a lot of carbon dioxide we know that it's humans who are, who are burning it. And the numbers are important. We started out at about 270 uh, parts per million, 280 parts per million before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this graph is a few years old. It's, we're over 390 parts per million right now. So it really means that the carbon dioxide concentration has increased by about 50%. I mean, it's, it's a pretty, um, pretty dramatic increase. Now, I, I, I give this lecture, or my energy lecture, I'll, I'll talk about it near the end, but I've given it a lot to uh, to a general public, and of course I always get a lot of climate change skeptics in the, in the audience, and you get questions like, well, it's never been shown that there's a connection between temperature and CO2, and, and you know, there is. Um, this, I love this paper, this is from uh, 19, 
67. And according to our estimate, the doubling of the CO2 content of the atmosphere has the effect of raising the temperature by about 2 degrees centigrade, which is basically in line with what we're using, what we think right now. And this was a very simple one-dimensional radiative transfer model. Um, I mean, we, we basically understand the science. I mean, we know we produce the CO2. We know the mechanism by which it produces a higher temperatures, which is pretty much in line with what we observe right now. And um, what it means in terms of variability, that's of course more difficult, but there are some, some things that are very clear. For example, the Arctic ice cap is disappearing. Uh, this, is a, this is a map of the Arctic ice cap in 1995 and 2007. Um, we lost 30% of the Arctic ice cap. I mean, this is why oil companies are moving in for offshore drilling of Alaska. This is why ConocoPhillips spent so much money on modeling the motion of ice flows because they want to put drilling rigs there. This is why we have now ships going the northern route from, uh, from Siberia to Europe. And this is why the Russians have put a flag on the, on the sea bottom at the North Pole. I mean, it's all about the Arctic ice cap is disappearing and there's a lot of resources there. And this is just happening. And this is not modeling, by the way. This is just this is data. We have satellites flying over the Arctic. They look down. They can see exactly where there is ice. They can see exactly where there is water. You're looking at data here. So it's pretty interesting what's happening here. Um, that's likely to have, and of course, you can argue that this is a natural change, and it might be. But there is a lot of these changes going on at the same time. Um, sea level rise is an interesting one. Um, it's expected that just because of the, the thermal expansion of the seawater that the sea level is about to rise somewhere between half a meter and a meter in the next century. Um, that doesn't include melting of ice cap of Greenland or Antarctica if that, if that would happen. Uh, which means that the dark red areas of uh, Florida would be in danger. And you might say, well, that's a thin strip along the coast. Um, Here's a nighttime image of Florida, and of course you can see that's where the people live. <coughs> and of course if you couple this to extreme weather events, then the impact of this sea level rise could be higher. But the interesting thing is if you go to different parts of the world, <coughs> and you know, you, this is, here you can see why Rob van der Hills and I are so tall. This is a map of the Netherlands, and you can already see that half of the Netherlands is below seawater. And the Dutch are so tall because the short ones, they all drown. <laughs> um, but it's interesting, you know, you, you, you can see that sea level rise is on the mental map of the Dutch. You know, they are, they're making models for raising their dikes and, and they're, they are, they're sort of working on it. But the real kicker comes when you go to a country like Bangladesh, which already is, of course, a country that deals with major flooding events. Um, and, you know, and these numbers are hard to estimate. But, but if our best estimate is that if we get a change in climate as we think it's going to happen over the next century, uh, about 25 million people in Bangladesh will be displaced. And I don't know if you have a suggestion for them where they can go to. I, I, I know they'd love to hear from you, uh, but if we think about these countries, and so there's also sort of moral issues to climate change, because the people <coughs> who cause the climate change and the people who suffer the biggest repercussions aren't necessarily the same ones. Um, so that's another dimension yet to climate change. The uh, third aspect I want to mention is just ocean acidification. Uh, we don't hear much about it, but if you get a higher carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, the ocean becomes more acidic, and a lot of the microorganisms living in the ocean have a shell of uh, calcite, um, and that, dissolve, that dissolves more in a more acidic ocean. And this is an interesting and also shocking experiment uh, this is a microphotograph of, a, of an animal, and I don't know what, it, what exactly it was, which they put in ocean water with the pH, which we think the pH will be in the year 2100. And they put it in that ocean water for one week, and now you see a photograph of its shell, and you see blow-ups on the right. Normally that shell is completely smooth. And you know, after one week it was already serrated because of the dissolution of the shell in, um, in more acidic ocean water. And you might say, well, what's the big deal? Well, this is the base of the food chain. A lot of the biological life thrives because of these small organisms. So let's think about then what can we do about sort of reducing our carbon dioxide emissions. And I, I want to discuss 
the, the, the wedges model of Pakala and Sokolov with you, which I'm sure many of you have seen, but I think it's, it's still a good estimate of, of um, what the numbers are. So here you see a graph, and the, the top line is our, our best estimate of our carbon dioxide emissions as a function of time, and it's, it's labeled the business as usual model, BAU. So if you basically continue going on as we do right now, uh, you can see how our carbon dioxide emissions will, will evolve. And what is going to be confusing is these, the units here are gigaton of carbon per year, and sometimes you'll talk about gigaton of CO2 per year, and there's a factor of three difference between the two. Um, so seven gigatons of carbon um, is what we produce right now. So the bottom line, which says WRE 500, is the carbon emissions we can afford ourselves if we want to cap the carbon concentration in the atmosphere at 500 parts per million. So let's, let's refresh our memories about the numbers. We started out at about 270 parts per million. We are 390 parts per million right now. If we say, okay, we want to cap our, our carbon dioxide concentration at 500 parts per million, then that bottom line is what we can uh, afford to send into the atmosphere. So, um, so then our task becomes clear. All the carbon emissions in the green sector we have to avoid. We have to get rid of those. We have to change our ways somehow that we avoid injecting that carbon into the atmosphere to reduce it to, uh, to the lower line. That's a big task. So what uh, Pakala and Sokolov did is they, they took that whole green area and they said, well, let, let's divide it up in seven triangles because to solve smaller problems, a number of smaller problems is easier than to solve one, one large problem. Um, so let, let's talk about some of these wedges, what they could be. Uh, and they actually identify 15 of them, 15 possibilities. So it could be energy uh, efficiency and uh, conservation, nuclear energy, uh, renewable energy fuels, more efficient forest and land use, agriculture is a big player too, or injecting carbon dioxide into the subsurface, carbon capture and sequestration. And what do you need to do? And this is, these are numbers from their 2004 papers. Uh, you know, generate electricity at 60% efficiency. Currently, we generate electricity at about 35% efficiency, which is amazing if you think about this. Uh, wind turbines are 3% of the surface of the United States. Photovoltaics, 700 times as much as in 2004. That sounds like a staggering number, but we've made a lot of progress actually uh, already. <coughs> Build 500 nuclear power plants, which really amounts to doubling the amount of nuclear power plants that we have or inject three gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. And this is what I want to uh, talk about now. So what is three gigatons? You know, I don't know how, you, how your mind work, but it works, but if I see more than sort of three zeros, my mind switches off. So I ask, what is three gigatons? <coughs> what is comparable to three gigatons? And very interesting that the three gigatons is comparable to the current world petroleum production. Okay, that's interesting, because that means that if we want to use one wedge, if we want to sequester one wedge of, of, of CO2, we need to sequester about the same amount of CO2 as the amount of petroleum that we are producing right now. That's an interesting challenge. Um, so we're going to need a big infrastructure. And to just give you a taste of how big our petroleum infrastructure is, this is a, a satellite image of Kuwait from space. Um, so north is to the right, you see the, Ku the city of Kuwait on the, all the way on the right. And then under the blue arrow, that's just one of the many, many fields in Kuwait. So that's sort of just a little part of the gigantic infrastructure that we have built to produce petroleum. So we probably, that depends on how we do, if we, if we want to sequester one wedge of CO2, we probably have to build something similar um, to just inject all that CO2 in the subsurface. So the interesting thing is the, 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 the cost of CO2 um, capture and, and sequestration. And it really depends on the situation. You know, there's different, depends on how much CO2 there is in your waste stream and whether it's CO2 coming out of a coal-fired power plant or whether it's CO2 co-produced with natural gas. But roughly the cost is between 30 of $70 um, per ton. Now multiply that with three gigatons per year, right? Because that was our target. So you end up with $150 billion per year. So this is an expensive hobby. 
Now, this is also where the research may have a role to play, because if you can bring those costs down, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a big, you can make a big difference. So I think if we really want to talk about carbon sequestration, the question arises, okay, so one wedge is going to cost us, with current technology, $150 billion per year. Are we willing to spend that amount of money? Yeah. It's about the same as an Iraq war, by the way. Same amount of money. Um, or do we, can, can we develop technology to, to reduce the cost? And you know, the answer might be yes. But I think we have to, realistically speaking, uh, I'm, I'm sort of pessimistic that we're going to spend that amount of money on sequestering CO2, given all the skepsis that we need to do it in the first place. So I think, you know, research question number one is how do we reduce the cost of carbon capture and sequestration? I think if you cannot bring the cost down, um, I'm very skeptical that we're going, going to do anything on a scale that makes a difference in terms of mitigating climate change. Uh, the other thing which I didn't really talk about yet is that it also costs quite a bit of energy to, to do the carbon capture and, um, and sequestration. It's mostly the, uh, the capture, in fact. Uh, about 30% of the energy that you have generated in the first place is going to be used for the capture and the sequestration. So that's another thing we need to deal with on top of the 70% increase in energy use that we have anyhow. The, uh, the second question that I wanted to mention, research question, that I think we need to tackle if this is going to be ever going to be big, is just the scale. Um, so you've heard about, probably about, sort of the success stories of carbon sequestration, the Weyburn project, um, in Saskatchewan, and in Sala in uh, Algeria, where uh, Schleichner in the North Sea. And we typically um, have injection rates there of about a megaton per year, a million tons per year. So let's, let's compare that again with this three gigatons that we need to inject to cover one wedge. It means that we need to upscale the technology with about a factor of 3,000. And I, I, don't think, I, I don't think we really know how to do that. Now maybe the answer is, well, you just build 3,000 as many injection sites as you have right now. That's what it takes. Maybe that's the answer. Um, or maybe there is more intelligent technology that we can use right now. This is where you know, where research can also, uh, can also play a role. Uh, this is the Sleipner platform in the North Sea where CO2 is co-produced with, uh, with natural gas. And there, because of the, uh, the legal reasons, it needs to be uh, injected back in the subsurface. So we roughly would need 3,000 of these, at least if you would do it in this way. And you, would, you wouldn't have to do it in this way. But again, we're talking about the huge infrastructure that you need. So that's the next research question, really, is you know, how do you upscale the current technology with about a factor of 1,000? And maybe the answer is, it's very simple. You just build 1,000 times as many facilities. Maybe that's the answer. I don't know. The other issue I, want, I wanted to, to raise is the, um, I think it's the least of the three, but it's still important to, uh, to know, this is where you know, geophysics may have a role to play, is just leakage rates. So you need to keep for CO2 to basically chemically connect with the host rock, you need about 200 to 300 years, depending on the temperature and the type of rock and things like that. So you need to keep it down for about 200 to 300 years. So I asked myself, well, if you, for certain leakage rates, how much are you going to lose over a time scale of, let's say, 200 years? And, and you see the answer here. And it really tells you that if you had a leakage rate of 1%, you basically lose all of it. I mean, so you may buy yourself some time by injecting it into the subsurface, but you're not, you're not really reaching your objective. It's all gone because it had time to chemically react with, with, with the host rock. Now, of course, if you have a leakage rate of 0.1%, you lose only, um, only 20%, so then the numbers look much more favorable. And um, well, you always hear the story, well, yeah, but uh, you know, we have cap, cap rocks. We, we know we can keep methane down for you know, I mean, hundreds of million years. Uh, and that, that's all, all very much true. Uh, but there's all the pipes and all the, all the fracturing that you do in the reservoirs. And I don't, I, don't, I don't think we really know how much we're, we're losing. And certainly geophysically, we cannot monitor such leakage rates. You know, I mean, 0.1% per year or 1% per year, I don't think we can monitor this. You almost have seen the papers on CO2 uh, sequestration projects and you see a, a map of seismic velocities before the injection and after the injection. Yeah, but then you basically go from 0% CO2 to 100% CO2. But what we really want to know is what, if, what happens if you go from 100% CO2 to 99% CO2? 
And we, we don't have the technology to do that. Um, so that's, that's again, that, that's, uh, that's another hurdle we need to take. Uh, you know, how do we monitor and predict extremely low leakage rates? It's, it's not about the big changes that we can monitor right now. That may tell us where the CO2 is going, and that's useful. Uh, but it doesn't say anything about leakage. I want to skip this. So, you know, I'm, I want to, these are sort of, I think these are three concerns that we need to tackle if CO2 carbon capture and sequestration ever is going to be different on a scale that's going to make a difference for, um, for climate. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that there aren't places where carbon capture and sequestration is a natural thing to do. Um, there are places like Insala where you're co-producing about 40% CO2 at your natural gas. You need to separate it anyhow. You separate it and you send it back so you keep your reservoir pressurized. You know, that, that really makes sense from, from many points of view. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about alternatives to carbon capture and sequestration to give you sort of a flavor of one of the many things we can do. I love this plot. This is from the Department of Energy and it's, it shows us on the left, it shows us the different sources of energy that we use, and then in the middle, it shows you for which purposes we use it, transportation, industrial, et cetera, et cetera. And on the right, it's divided into <laughs> use, useful and into lost energy. Um, so lost energy is all the heat we dissipate in the power plants, all the heat we dissipate in our power lines, the, all these sort of things. 60%. Um, well, I, I know there's thermodynamics. I, I know there's, you know, the Carnot cycle has a certain limited, it puts an upper bound on the efficiency that we can get. But we can, we can be more intelligent than we are right now. I stayed at a hotel recently where there were two heating and cooling units and two thermostats. And one of them was set at 68 degrees and the other one at 72 degrees. Guess what? One of them is sending a jet of hot air into my room and the other one is sending a jet of cold air into my room. And this wasn't the old hotel where they knocked out some walls. This hotel was two years old. It was built that way. And I first thought it was a quirk of my room, but then I checked other people who stayed at the same hotel. Every room had the same system. It's amazing. Uh, we still have stores where uh, the storefronts, there's no doors in them during opening hours uh, because that will deter customers from coming in. So in the winter time, we're sending out all that hot air on the street and on the on the, in the in the summertime, there's all the cool air is disappearing. You know, we, we still build things like that. I mean, we can do better than this. So that's the first thing. The other thing I want to show you is a uh, it's a study done by McKinsey, and it's an amazing study. So this is you know McKinsey Business Consulting. This this is not this is not the Shera Club. Uh, this is just from the core of the of the of the business community. It was a study done of the cost of avoiding CO2 emissions. Now this graph is way too complicated. Uh, you know, I, I would fire my students if they would ever show it. Um, so I, 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 I redid it, but all the numbers are quantitatively more or less the same. So I'm, I'm going to show you a simplified version of this, of this graph. And I need to explain what this is. This is going to take a little time, but it's really amazing. Um, so on the ho each of these bars is a step that we can take to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. So for example, efficient cars and trucks, it's very simple. If you drive a, a truck or a car that uses less fuel, you produce less CO2. You know, I mean, it's not rocket science. Yeah? And the width of every bar is for the United States, the amount of CO2 emissions avoided per year if we implement each of these steps on a large scale. So the wider the bar is, the more efficient it is for avoiding CO2 emissions. If you add up all these, all these different steps, you end up at 3 gigatons per year, and currently we produce about 7 gigatons per year. So if you do all of this, we have avoided 40% of our carbon dioxide emissions. So we've made a big, big change. So the vertical axis gives us the cost of each of these steps, the long-term cost of each of these steps in units of dollars um, per ton of CO2 avoid, emissions avoided. So these are long-term costs. They're not short-term costs. And I, the reason I say that is for many of these steps, uh, before you can sort of reap the profit of the long-term cost, you have to make short-term inve investments. And the cool thing is, is that all the bars indicated in green have a negative cost. 
That's a complicated way of a business consultant to say you can save money or you can make money. All the steps in, in blue have a positive cost, which means that you have to pay for them. Um, you're, you're not going to get it back. And the one on the right is carbon sequestration, which is about $50 per ton of CO2. Uh, you can see it's, it's the most expensive option. So how does this work? And again, it's not rocket science. You know, if you, if you let, let's go to efficient new buildings, for example. I mean, retrofitting old buildings to make them more energy efficient is economically, you, you don't really get your money back. Uh, for new buildings, for an energy efficient building, it might cost you up to 10% more to build them, sometimes even less. Uh, so at first you have to make an investment, but on the long term you can actually, you can save money. I mean, technically we know how to do it. There's homes in Colorado now that don't need a heating system. That use passive solars, that are, that are well insulated, uh, they don't use a heating system anymore. Technically we know how to do it. Uh, we're just not doing it. So the reason I show this to you also is that, you know, if, if we'd be willing to really change the way we do things, um, we could make a huge difference and we could create jobs in the meantime and, and sort of create a different type of economy. We're not really doing it because we stick to the plan which is to burn more carbon. Um, but this is a, I, I found this a, a, a really interesting um, way to look at it. Uh, and again, you have to keep in mind here that uh, there are short-term investments before you can sort of reap the profits of the, of the savings that you can, uh, that you can make. So again, here are, here are the three major questions I, I think that we face for carbon sequestration. I mean, if, if you ever want to do it on a scale that is going to make a difference from climate, which really means we have to get into the gigaton regime, how can we reduce the cost? How can we upscale the current technology with a factor of 1,000? How can we monitor very small leakage rates? And you know, there's interesting research questions here. I think if we can, if we can make a sort of a game-changing um, approach in any of these questions, that would be a real contribution. So, I, I want to end by one last ingredient to the mix, and um, as I mentioned before, I think education has to be part of the story. Education has to be part of the story. If you want to change the behavior of people, um, that is very difficult in general. And the first thing you need to do is inform people. Now, informing people is not enough to bring about behavioral change, you know, any psychologist will tell you that. Um, and all you teachers know this because you may teach something to a student, but it doesn't mean they know how to, how to apply it. But it's the first step you have to take. And you have to go and tell the story uh, about energy, how it's related to climate. Do it in a non-political way, which I think is very, very important because this, this whole conversation has been drawn very effectively into a political decision. And to a large extent, it's a, it's a scientific issue. Um, so I developed this, this uh, a public lecture, it's called the Global Energy Challenge. You can, you can download it through the internet if you would be interested to, to use it. Um, I've given it more than 100 times to you know, schools, churches, universities, community colleges, service clubs. Service clubs are always keen to have speakers. Uh, and I've always found that people were very, very interested to hear about this. And I think, you know, to be honest, as, as scientists, we have a, a role to play in society. And part of that role is to just tell the story that, that must be told. Just to, to sketch you what, how, how little people understand about this issue, is this is one of my favorite slides of my presentation. I, I, I do a quiz and I say, well, this is like one of the coal trains that you see in Colorado all the time. And every car of coal has, every railroad car carries 100 tons of coal. How much CO2 do I produce when I burn the coal? Anybody wants to uh, answer this question? Three times. Pardon? Three times, right. But yeah, that's, that, that's a Navi talk sauce, right? Because the, <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> right, no, thank you, Navi. Most, I usually, I usually, I didn't want to embarrass you, I'm sorry. I usually get an answer like, oh, a few ounces. And I ask them, why a few ounces? And people say, oh, it's a gas, it's light. That tells you something about, you know, what people understand. And, I, I do the math with middle schoolers. I do the math and I say, if you drive a mile in your car, you produce a pound of CO2. That's a pretty amazing number, right? And by the way, if you fly, it's, it's slightly less, but it's about the same order of magnitude. 
And, and by making these connections, now we suddenly start to understand, oh, I take my car instead of my bicycle or the bus or whatever, that's going to produce a pound of CO2 per, per mile that I cover. It gives some sort of a bigger awareness of what the impact of our actions are. Um, the other thing is also, and that's sort of, a, I think, for, for scientists, an interesting, uh, interesting message. We have different types of problems. There's technical problems and there are adaptive problems. And as scientists, we really are good at the technical problems, and we usually suck at the adaptive problems. So technical problems are, are problems where sort of expertise is available. Maybe we have to, to figure out some issues, but basically the question is well posed. Uh, we have the researchers who can do it. There's a clear path forward. We just have to figure out how to do this or that. Um, we need to manage things. Uh, you just, technical problems are easy in the sense that you, you just throw money at them and you can usually solve them. Um, and then the question becomes to optimize the ex execution. The hard problems are the, the adaptive problems where we don't know the expertise. We, don't, we, we might not know what the real question is. What is it that we really need to know so we can solve this problem? Those are, those are much harder problems. Um, it requires learning along the way. It requires leadership. So this, this comes to the issue of management versus leadership. You know, leadership involves having a vision, articulating that vision, putting it forward, and then implementing that vision. And yes, you will have to change. Now, you know, we don't like to change. Uh, especially scientists, you know, we like to think that we are very innovative, but we really would like to keep things the way that we are. Uh, and we need to experiment and we need to take risk. And I think, you know, when it comes to, let's say, the energy, worldwide energy system in connection to the worldwide climate system, it's very much an adaptive problem. There certainly are technical problems that need to be solved and, and problems that we will solve. But I think to make a really, to make a big dent, we need to see it like an adaptive problem. And that's going to take a big leap and that's going to take a lot of willpower and it's going to take strong, strong leadership. So I, wa I want to end with this slide because it, it, sort of, it sort of captures, I think, the situation where we are to a certain extent. I, I love this picture. So, so here's this tennis player, right? And the ball is coming at him, right? And, and, and he's, he's so focused on his problem, the ball, that he's, he has this crazy cross-eyed view. And that's, of course, what he needs to do to kick the ball. I mean, or strike the ball. Do they kick the ball in tennis or do they strike it? <laughs> they strike it, right? To strike the ball. And um, so that's great. You know, we need people like that. But do you think this tennis player has a good situational awareness? Do you think that he knows what's going on on the field? Do you, do you think he, uh, he can have a big, he can develop sort of a long-term adaptive strategy on how to win the game? At this point he can't, right? <laughs> and so we need people like this. We need people like this, but I think we also need people with that sort of that broad long-term vision and also people who are willing to, to communicate that vision in, in a way that is sort of understandable and compelling to general public, politicians, you name it, because we need their buy-in if we ever want to change something. So with that, I would like to, uh, I'd like to end. And if there's any comments, questions, I'd be happy to take them. Oh, the McKinsey where, where, study. Where you have the, right. The, the, the cost. I mean, yeah, no, the, well, the next one, I guess. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I think this 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 slide is is the crux of the issue. We have to reduce these emissions by forty percent, and we've got to divide them into pieces uh, in order to do that. And then the question is, what, what are the most cost-effective uh, solutions? Yeah. Right. I've I've made uh, plots like this. And when I make a plot like this, the carbon sequestration box is further to the left than the renewable energy box. And so my question is, given this penalty that you talked about, of say a 70% penalty of cost, what kind of renewables do you have that, are, that you're seeing as competitive with uh, gas uh, power generation, for example, yeah. uh, with a multiplier of 1.7? Yeah. You know, um, I don't really know. You have to. You have to the word competitive, you, of course, you need to be a little bit careful 
with it because it depends a lot on the current situation. You know, it, it was about five years ago when T-Bone T -bone Pickens, you know, one of the biggest investors in hydrocarbon resources, was investing heavily in, in wind power. And then we, we learned how to do the, the fracking and make it come online. And now wind power has become much less attractive than it was. And so first of all, it, it depends very much on, on prices. And prices are very volatile, especially natural gas. It also may depend on uh, being, the degree to which it is competitive depends also on politics. For example, if, if you would have a carbon tax, things would change immediately. You know, like in Europe, for example, where basically uh, hydrocarbons cost twice as much as they do here, uh, there's much more incentive to use renewables. It's still expensive, it's, but um, so, so competitive, economically competitive is more than the prices that they are right now. There's, it's a very complicated issue, it depends on politics. Um, the, the other thing is, of course, and I, I hope you understand me well, there's, you know, I, I don't want to demonize carbon sequestration. That's not my intention at all. And there, and there, are, of, there again, you would, you would take an approach like you suggested. You start with the low-hanging fruit, and you work at the places where you need to get rid of the carbon anyhow, or where it's relatively cheap to do the, to do the, to do the injection. And you don't start out with the most expensive projects, right? That really would make sense. And so that's also going to be... A, we probably need to do research to find out what, what works, what doesn't work, and uh, so that there's many unknowns. And of course, I didn't show you error bars here. Uh, they're pretty big, right? And, and if, you leak, if you read the McKinsey report, they actually give you three scenarios, the, 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 the low-cost scenario, the medium-cost scenario, and the high-cost scenario. I'm showing you the medium-cost scenario. Um, but what I find interesting is that the McKinsey study is seven years old. And I never hear anybody talk about this. And if you, if you are planning energy policy, I mean, this is sort of telling such a rich story. Yeah. Yes? Well, a couple of things about the Kent's report. Right. First of all, it, you know, the, it, showing these things sort of in, in the boxes, it, there's, a re, there's a big range sure. of cost and all of them. So there's overlapping Absolutely. going on yeah. all the time. But I think mean, one reason you don't hear about the McKinsey report is been pretty much panned by the uh, uh, people that work in this area. Um, you know, it was an interesting thing, but th th there's a lot of problems with it technically. I, I don't think it's the time to go into it now. And especially yeah. the economists hate the negative numbers. Yeah. I and mean, they don't believe in those. You, know, you don't find well, $20 bills on the right. sidewalk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but there, there, there's other things with it. So, I mean, it's very much bottom up. And there's, I don't know, dozens of these type things that top down and bottom up all through, and you look at them all, we look at them all, and the, they all tell different, as Brad says, his looks a little different, they all look a little different. Sure. It depends on your assumptions. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, yeah. so, so it's useful in some ways, but to <clears throat> sort of over-rely on one, you know, versus the other, and, and, um, and, and just say this is the way it is, it, it's, it's sort of tr you know, troublesome, and, and a lot of the stuff, and also the problem with the, the wedges, as well as some of the uh, uh, demand side here, is you know, there's a lot of things in this rebound effect on, on energy efficiency. So as energy efficiency that makes your energy cost less, you, you know, there's some using more, and you look at the literature, all the they have right. going all the way from zero to one. Right. Uh, so 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 it's you know it's fairly complicated. But I mean, you, all the details, right? I mean, they are completely in the noise, of course. Yeah. And but you know if. Some things are pretty simple, like if you have a car that uses less fuel, that's right. you're going to spend less money and you, you, and you burn less CO2, but you know, I mean, that's... The amount of CO2 you save is not proportional to the amount of fuel you... The, the amount of uh, uh, the MPG per, per mile reduction because... Right. People, people, people will drive Because more. it shows you will drive right. more miles. Now, how many more miles... Absolutely. Miles? No, I, I know, I know, but you have to... First of all, you have to start somewhere. And the other thing is, of course, I, I think it's also good to look at other parts of the world. Like I mentioned, Europe, for example, where uh, we have about half the CO2 permissions per capita that we have here. And that's, I think, where also the, the education comes in. Um, but there's also some very um, differences in, in climate. There's differences in, yeah. you know, things are much closer together. We have much more uh, mass transit there. So, so I mean, yeah. there's reasons for it. Now, you right. can say, right. so, so some of it's technical. But some of it's also, I right. think, cultural. Yeah. And, and, Absolutely. Uh, so I mean, you know, in 
the thing that always gets me, because you know, I always criticize the United States for being uh, uh, energy wasters. Well, you know, Germany is one of the leaders in mm -hmm. wanting to reduce it, but they had a referendum about 10 years ago about whether to put speed limits on the autobahn, mm -hmm. not crush. Yeah. I mean, you know, so there's certain cultural things you Absolutely. need. Absolutely. And Norway, very efficient at everything, but all their heating is uh, electric resistance heating. Or yeah. the worst efficient ways to heat your right. home, but they don't have the infrastructure right. to replace it, even though they have all this. And they have a little hydropower, to, and they have a little hydropower, yeah. so, so electricity. So, so every country has their, their quirks, and it's not so I easy know. to change. I know. But on the other hand, you know, we like to, United States, to see ourselves as leaders in the world. And it, there, there's an opportunity for leadership here that I think we aren't really exercising. And, and you know, I mean, I'm not an expert on any of this, and I'm sure that there's, there's many things that you can, you can critique. But there's, there's a very basic principles out here that we don't really talk about a lot. I mean, a smaller car uses less fuel. That's a, and, and actually, we're doing that now. I mean, oh, President Obama has, uh, I mean, there's, we have had tighter fuel standards now for cars, and, and so part of it is already happening. But, but uh, there's also a report from our economists here that said if we put a carbon tax on instead of the fuel standards, not all, you, you get the fuel savings at one-sixth the cost. Yeah. So, so yeah. the policy is yeah. important, especially right. if it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. You want to use the most efficient policy. Yeah. And, and um, it's an interesting study. It did, just came out fairly recently. No, and policy is absolutely important, and, uh, but you know, there, that, that's also why I think, that's another reason why I think education is so important, because the voter behavior is going to be very much determined by how well the population is involved. And you know, I, I'm always amazed if I, I never watch television, but if I, sometimes I do, I'm always amazed that you see these car commercials for selling you big cars, basically telling you, if you don't have a car like this, you're not a real man. <laughs> and to be honest, that, that's, the education that most people see. And I think as scientists, we have to open our mouths. Yes? Just a comment. Uh, I work for the Norwegian uh, Ministry yeah? uh, on CTS. OK, yeah. So I'm here with Oslo. Uh, and we have tried uh, for many years to implement CTS in Norway. Uh, you mentioned Schleppner. Mm -hmm. And I just mentioned that uh, the tax that uh, Stato, the right. company, pays is approximately 100 dollar per policy emitter. Mm -hmm. So that is the one required to mm -hmm. make CCS mm -hmm. the cheapest CCS mm -hmm. And to make CCS happen on a coal-fired program, the gas-fired the cost would be much higher than what shown here because mm -hmm. it has never been done before, mm -hmm. but the first one right. is doing it is yeah. Canada, actually. And the cost will increase, and they have to, you have to implement a tax system or any right. way. And that is disrupting the, the business model for the for the oil companies, mm -hmm. the energy companies, and that is a huge change. And maybe that's the biggest thing of the missing representation because the change in business model, the way you think, right. the carbon looking, is tremendous. And we are really struggling with that. One thing cost and the carbon looking, the way you think, right. the way everything is set up. Yeah. You mentioned the volume. We have spent in Europe maybe hundred years to distribute the gas. Uh, with pipelines, and we have need pipelines and capacities to transport as much CO2 back in there. That takes time. Yeah. So we are doing that. It's extremely important, but the way forward is troublesome. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I think we just need to recognize the issue, and, and that, that's really my main message. That, at least, that's what I, that's what I hope to communicate. That there's many alternative things we could do. But we'd have to change some things. And you know, and that might change the economic model and yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll get back to you in a, to a second. Yes. But, um, I think one of the points that you brought up is there's some quote unquote low, low hanging fruit that we could start right. with and then proceed to the more um, expensive mm -hmm. things. But here there's, there's the short term and the long term issues, right? Yeah. Because even if we do these things in the short term, we're not it is not an effective enough strategy to ensure that we can continue to walk the low carbon path in right. the future. And what that requires is investment today. Yeah. So what kind of strategy would you propose if you have to balance both the needs of the <coughs> next 10 years and the next 100 years? Yeah, wow, that's a, that's a tough one. So you ask if I were king. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a dangerous thing. 
Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, it's not that I have a clear policy in mind, of course. The, the other thing is, of course, is that, and, and this comes back to being a leader. If, if, I mean, if you look at the numbers, of course, most of, already most of the CO2 is not emitted in the United States now. It's, I mean, China is just outpacing us very quickly. So the question is also, what would we like to achieve? Are we, are we, is it about the molecules that we take out of the, or that we avoid injecting into the air right here? Or is it about developing the technology and maybe the way of living that, that would be an example for the rest of the world? Because that might be actually be more effective in the, in the long run. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't have a, I don't have a policy or a plan. I just, so it's, it's obviously very, very complicated, yeah. Can I, actually, there was, the gentleman over there was there. He had a hand up first. There are, there are a couple of reasons. There are actually several reasons why the industry doesn't take the emergency report very seriously. And just one of them is the life cycle, absence of life cycle analysis very mm -hmm. seriously. For example, you take hybrid cars, and everybody thinks that they actually save fuel mm -hmm. by running, uh, driving hybrid cars. In reality, just mining of lithium is extremely expensive yeah. in terms of CO2 emissions. You know, a lithium battery has to go through 100 life cycles, full charges, discharges, before you can actually make up for the CO2 that is emitted during the mining of lithium. So if you do the full life cycle analysis, most of these negative numbers actually tend to become positive. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, number one. Number two is you didn't talk anything about population issues. Oh, yeah. Given the size of the population, I really yeah. don't see yeah. how there's a viable solution to this issue of global warming. Mm -hmm. If everybody yeah. wants to live like the way yeah. they live here. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Do you have any comments? No, it's absolutely no, true. I actually deliberately stay away from the population issue, although it may be, it's the biggest elephant in the room, although it's not about elephants. And uh, it's, it, it's a big issue. And um, obviously, I mean, I mean, it's basically Maltes again, right? I mean, it's, uh, that, that many, of the, many of that still holds. And um, it, it, if you talk about it, I found that it very often becomes a very charged issue. Uh, because what do we really do? And it, 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 from what, and again, I'm not, a, I'm not a expert on, well, I'm pretty good at family planning, but that's small numbers, but you know. <laughs> um, but uh, in, in general, to, to set policies for population planning is, is very, very difficult. It looks like education, again, in, in developing countries is one of the most important things you can do. I mean, education, raising the standard of living may actually also help. So your, those eight, eight children might not be needed to cover your, um, basically, your life when, you are, when you're getting old. Um, I don't know, you know, there wasn't, a, but it's, it's a very difficult issue to, to, to bring into the conversation. Uh, there was this article in Physics Today, uh, was it about seven years ago? Somebody made the same point, and it's very interesting to read the letters that were sent into Physics Today afterwards, which was, I mean, he was, he was accused of genocide and whatever, and uh, it was interesting, interesting. But you're right, it is, of course, one of the, one of the big issues. Yeah. Yes, you had a question. I, uh, it seems to me that there's something <coughs> qualitatively about the carbon sequestration bar on that graph. And this graph? Which is that if the goal, for example, was to stabilize concentration of right. CO2, and you did it by carbon sequestration, it puts an absolute number on how much it costs and it tells right. you exactly how much carbon tax you have to raise. So it objectively prices carbon in a way that some of those other mm -hmm. bars don't do. Would that not, if I understood you correctly, if you did that today, it would roughly double the price of that seems um, to me to be a surprisingly small number. I thought that was a very optimistic, given that, yeah. for example, Americans could immediately right. compensate for that by becoming as efficient as Europeans. Yeah. They wouldn't even notice it. No, but I think that, that is about a number. So um, would that not drive developments across that whole other range of bars? Just having that carbon tax driving people toward yeah. efficiency, driving up other... Yeah. You know, I... I Howard, you may know the number, but like for electricity production, if you would use carbon capture and sequestration, how much would the price go up per kilowatt? It, it was yeah, a few tens of percent? The range we're using is between 1.7 and 2.1. Cents per? Well, uh, multiplier. So multiplier. Okay. So what, okay. The cost is expert. Okay. Today, so let's say it would be twice as expensive. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. I think that's quite right. Well, 
How long would it yeah. be a factor of two? If it started driving all these other things, right? right. Right. When it, it seemed to me that factor two would drop yeah. after a while. No, and, I, the, and, and the other yeah. thing is, if you look at the macro economy, so some of the work that Jake's group has done is, is they, you know, they, just to give you an example, they, they talk like maybe 3% loss of welfare between now and 2050. And what that means is, say, that this, the GDP would go out from 100 today to 200 then. Well, it means the GDP would just go from 100 today to 197 right. then. Right. So, you know, there's still lots of money, 1% of GDP, but it's, you know, compared to what we may have to pay if we don't do it, it seems pretty yeah. reasonable. So, so, I mean, there's, it's affordable. The, the big political problem is there's lots of winners and losers in there. You know, that's yeah. sort of meshed across the whole economy. Yeah. There's businesses that will go out, there new businesses come in, and we know how they have to, you know, how politics works with that. Yeah. Because also, the, you know, three gigatons per year times $50 per ton, that's $150 billion. That's a lot of money, but on the big scale of things, it's absolutely manageable if we would want to do it. And you have to factor in the damage to the economy. The yeah. Of not doing yeah. All. There was an effort by, uh, it's, it's documented in the Stern report, to calculate the cost of acting versus not acting. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that's very difficult because there's lots of unknowns, but as I understand that the cost of not acting would be more expensive than the cost of acting. But the, the problem is who carries the cost. And yeah, absolutely. You had a? That's yes. Got a comment. Regarding going, when you talk about having more efficient cars and trucks, the idea of always going to electric or hybrid cars for me is absurd. Yeah. Honestly, I've lived in Argentina now in Australia and I've come here for a visit and I sit in the highway and I see nothing but SUVs with one person in them. Yeah. And a diesel car with a 1.4 turbocharged engine can do everything that SUV can in urban driving and use a fraction of the fuel. The and the technology has been developed and been used for the last 20, 20 30 years. Yeah. And it's got the same life cycle, it's got low cost of power generation, it costs low, I mean, you, you reduce your electricity consumption to build it, to dispose of it, and to use it. So I understand that you know, low-hanging fruit is, is difficult, but in cars, it's very easy. And on the, other side, on the other hand, in Australia, they just put in a new carbon tax, which is $23 per ton. And the price of electricity has grown 88% in the last couple of years, but not because of carbon taxing, because everybody's installing air conditioners. So they have to gold plate their entire grid to sustain air conditioners for two months. 88% growth increase in electricity just because we keep on using electricity in an inefficient way. And carbon tax got dwarfed by this, but the politics of it is that the opposition says carbon tax is killing the country. And it's not true. It's just a matter of letting things go and letting things start to, I mean, there's always a cost to something. Like if you have to build a highway, there's a cost to building a highway. Now, is it better for the population? Is it giving you a benefit? Now, that's the sort of thing that should be evaluated when you ask, is there a cost? Of course there's cost. Everything costs money. But what are the benefits and what are the potential uh, savings is what I think should be turned into people's heads and communicated to the public. That's just my point of view. Yeah. I will not repeat your question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Dale. I will just end, you know, I always have to make a joke on the weather here. Oh, great. I love talking jokes. talking about um, population. Mm -hmm. Just let us send out the message for population. Yeah. Because we have this argument a lot in our lab here. And we've got one individual who insists that you must have six to eight children. I know who you mean. I have the argument all the time. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But if you need advice, I, I, have, I have some tips. <laughs> okay, so what? Okay, on that note, let's thank Roll Again.